And so we're continuing our sermon series. Um, we're continuing to look at the story of the birth of Jesus. Um, we're preparing our hearts to celebrate Christmas um, this year, this Saturday. Um, and so we looked at Mary's story um, in the past two weeks. And together, I think we were just amazed again at, at the way she responded to the message that God sent through the angel Gabriel. And I know I was encouraged as I studied the way that Mary and Elizabeth responded with faith and trust to God's work in their lives. Um, and so today we're going to look at Luke chapter 2. Um, we're going to be reading um, Luke 2 uh, verses 1 to 7. Um, so hear now uh, the word of the Lord. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And so, together, let's read Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Please pray with me. Father, please send the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds to your word today. Uh, we are not worthy to receive you, Jesus, um, but you know this. Uh, we're not able to understand you and your word on our own. And you know this. Um, so, Father, we ask you to send the Holy Spirit to help us see Jesus today. And we ask it in his name. Amen. So, the big idea or main point for today's sermon um, is, is there room in your heart for Jesus? And One, verse, One Voice Fellowship, as you know, is a church of people from many nations. And many of you did not want to leave your home country. Many of you were forced to move from one place to another. Uh, some of you actually escaped dangerous situations in your home countries. And some of you are waiting now. You're waiting for the U.S. government to process your immigration paperwork. And so many of you know what it feels like to have your life changed dramatically because what government officials do or don't do. Um, and so with these thoughts in mind, I want to look more closely at what Luke wrote in Luke 2, verses 1 to 3. It says that in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered, and this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And each went to be registered, each to his own town. So Caesar Augustus, who you see on the screen here, um, he was the first Roman emperor. He was the one who expanded the Roman Empire, which was a republic, but he expanded it into an empire by building a network of roads. And he started a police force. He started firefighting services in, Rome's, in Rome, but he was also a dictator. He was a dictator who had many of his opponents executed, hundreds of senators killed. And so Caesar Augustus was not a good man, but God's timing is always good. The rule of Caesar Augustus began what is called the Pax Romana, or the Roman peace. 200 years of the Pax Romana. 
And because Rome controlled so much territory, you can see it here, because Rome controlled so much territory, the apostles, with the message of Jesus Christ, the apostles were able to travel freely through the Roman Empire, sharing the gospel. And so the early Christian church grew quickly and widely, and in part because of this Pax Romana. And one of the ways that Caesar Augustus controlled his empire was through taxation. And so to tax people, you have to count them. And that's why everyone was being registered at the time Jesus was born. Caesar Augustus could force people to travel long distances to be counted. Caesar Augustus was very powerful. He thought he was in control. But my friends, God is in control of all things and all people and all events. And God the Father chose exactly where and when to send his son to be born. Jesus was born at the intersection of three continents. You can see Judea there on the map. It's at the intersection of Africa, Asia, and Europe. Jesus was born at a time when the message of the gospel could travel more easily than before. In uh, Galatians 4, verses 4 to 5, the Apostle Paul says it this way. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law that we might receive adoption to sonship. And so Jesus, the Son of God, was born at the time set by God the Father. Jesus was born under the law of Moses. He was born under the law of Rome. But the Son of God came to redeem and save us from the law so God the Father could adopt us as sons and daughters. And so God is always in control, my friends. God is always in control. That's what I want you to remember. Sometimes our plans do not work out, right? We prayed for some of our brothers and sisters tonight about their plans and the things that they're hoping and asking God they can do. Sometimes our prayers are not answered the way we hope for. Sometimes the road before us takes an unexpected detour. Uh, my family was supposed to go to Florida tomorrow, and now we're not going because there's COVID in our house. That's not our plan. But Proverbs 16.9 says, The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. And if we think about Mary, we've been thinking about Mary for two weeks. I am sure that Mary wanted to give birth to her child in Nazareth. Nazareth was her home. Nazareth is where she had family and friends. In Nazareth, Mary would have support and help when the baby arrived. But Joseph obeyed the command of Quirinius, who was the Roman governor, and so let's read what happened next in verses 4 and 5. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And so you can see here on this map where Nazareth is and where Bethlehem is. Joseph and Mary traveled about 90 miles while she was pregnant. And so Joseph and Mary were forced to travel to Bethlehem because of government orders. The government's not in control, though. It's God who is truly in control. 700, 700 years before Jesus was born, 
700 years before, the prophet Micah wrote this. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he will be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. So Micah was talking about Jesus. The prophet Micah actually used some of the same language we heard the angel Gabriel say to Mary about Jesus in Luke 1, 32 and 33. Look at, look at how similar these messages are. In, in, in Luke 1, 32, it said, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will rule over the house of Israel forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. My friends, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. The Pax Romana was a temporary, man-made peace. It was a peace that was enforced with brutality and oppression. But the peace that God offers to the world is very different. And this peace comes in an unexpected place. And it comes in a surprising way. So let's continue looking at the story in verses 6 and 7. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Because there was no place for them in the inn. So, sometime after Joseph and Mary arrived in Bethlehem, Jesus was born. And Luke tells us that there was no place for them in the inn. Now, inns and hotels were not common 2,000 years ago. And a small town like Bethlehem definitely didn't have a hotel like we think of a hotel today. But the Greek word inn means guest room. And... So we don't know really if Jesus was born in a stable or a cave or a room in a private home. But what Luke reports to us simply is that the best location, the ideal location for the birth, was not available. Jesus was born near animals in a humble second choice location. And we know that there were animals nearby because he was laid in a manger. Um, he was laid in a manger in, and we think this, this is what a manger might have looked like. Um, these mangers were used to feed cows and donkeys and sheep. And so my friends, what I want you to know is that your Savior, your Savior was not born in a castle. He wasn't born in a rich family's home. Your Savior chose Joseph to be his earthly father so that he would be born in a tiny, unimportant town. Jesus chose an ordinary carpenter to be his earthly father so that he would be born in a borrowed room and laid in a donkey's food bowl. That's who your Savior is. No other religion on earth worships a God like this. Other religions would never even imagine such a thing. And, and that's one reason that we know it's true. Because no human would have invented a story like this if they wanted to impress people with the birth of their Lord and Savior. This is not a story someone would invent. Jesus the king is not born in a palace or a capital city. He's born in a borrowed space in a small town. Mary was forced to leave her hometown where she could have given birth surrounded by family and friends 
and Mary was then denied the opportunity to give birth in a proper guest room in Bethlehem. And many of you come from cultures that value hospitality. You are generous with your homes. You're happy to have guests. And so how do you prepare your home? Think about how you get your home ready when you're expecting visitors. Do you clean the house? Of course you do. We know how to clean our houses to prepare for guests, but there's a harder question I want to ask you. Have you ever tried to clean your heart? And is your heart clean enough to welcome Jesus as a guest? Paul prayed this in Ephesians 3, 16 to 17. He said, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, God will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. And then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. Christ wants to make his home in our hearts But every human heart has the dirt of sin inside. We all have a sin problem that we cannot fix. And we can't wash it away. But this is the good news, friends. Jesus is our guest. And Jesus is our guest who prepares the guest room for his own arrival. So we were supposed to be driving 19 hours to Florida tomorrow. And tomorrow night, we were going to spend a hotel, a night in the hotel to break up the trip. Now, imagine if if you arrived at a hotel and the hotel manager gave you a vacuum and a bucket and he told you that you needed to clean your hotel room before you could stay in the room. That would be crazy. Wouldn't that be crazy if that's what happened? But that's what Jesus does. Jesus prepares our hearts to, for him to stay there. Jesus does not demand that we clean our hearts before he comes to us. Because Jesus knows the truth about our hearts. He knows that our hearts are full of sin and darkness. But he is full of grace and light. And so before Jesus can be Lord of our life, and live in our hearts, we must be washed clean. And that's something only he can do. And so the good news of Christmas is that Jesus came to earth to live the perfect life we never could. He died as a sacrifice for our failure in sin. And many people don't believe about the sin problem in their hearts. As you know, 10 years I was an atheist, and I didn't want anyone to tell me about my sin problem. But I knew it was true. I I had bad habits I couldn't stop. I knew that I was full of pride and lust, which I tried very hard to hide from everyone around me. But God knew. And so God in his kindness prepared my heart by showing me my sin. And then he showed me the most powerful cleaning force in the universe. It's the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus, the most powerful cleaning force in the universe because he's the only perfect man who ever lived. And his blood is the only thing that can clean your heart to prepare it for God to come and live inside of you. And so, if you've accepted the bad news about your sin and received the good news of the gospel, then Jesus is welcome in your heart. Is there room in your heart for him? And I'm going to read a a section of a sermon now about this same question. This is a sermon by Charles Spurgeon. And he was a pastor in London, England, 150 years ago. And I want you to listen to these challenging questions from Charles Spurgeon. Did the palaces of emperors and the halls of kings offer refuge to Jesus, the royal stranger? No. Seldom is there room for Christ among the royalty. 
The throne rooms and royal palaces are rarely open to Christ. He visits cottages more than palaces. But maybe, maybe in the government, in, in the places where politicians make laws, was there room for Christ there? No, my friends. Maybe there was room for Christ among successful people. Were there some people in Bethlehem that were respectable? People who had honor and good reputations? No, my dear friends, there was no room for him there because fine clothes, rank and honor, jewels and wealth, these things occupy too much space in their hearts. And they say they have no room for Jesus and no need of him. Maybe there is room for him at the stock exchange or in the shops and stores and businesses. Maybe there is room for Christ here? No, dear friends. There is little of the spirit and life of Christ found here. Bankruptcy, greed, and fraud are abundant in the business world. There is no room for Jesus there. And then... There are the schools of the philosophers. Surely they would welcome Jesus and his infinite wisdom. But no, dear friends, it is not true. There's very little room for Christ in colleges and universities. He is rarely welcome in the places of deep learning. A few wise ones have bowed like children at the feet of the baby of Bethlehem. But sadly, many of the educated are too conscious of their own knowledge and proud of their own wisdom. They say, who is this Christ that we should recognize him? But surely there was one place that Jesus could go to the elders in Jerusalem or to the priests and Levites at the Lord's temple. Was there room for Jesus in the temple or the synagogue? No, he found no shelter there. It was there that he faced his strongest enemies throughout his life. There was no room for him in the place, in the temple, where his name was chanted in psalms and prayers among the smoke of incense. No, my friends, look anywhere and everywhere, and you will find that there is only one place for the Prince of Peace. The home of Christ is with the humble. He comes to repentant hearts, hearts prepared by his grace to be his shelter. The palace, the government, and all the world have no room for Christ. But do you have room for him? Here is our royal master. Do you have room for him? Here is the Son of God made flesh. Do you have room for him? Here is the Jesus who can forgive all sins. Do you have room for him? Here is the one who can pull you from the horrible pit. Do you have room for him? He is the one who comes to you and promises to never leave or forsake you. Do you have room for him? Your emptiness and brokenness are the space that he needs. He's ready to move into the heart that feels unworthy and unready. Do you have room for him, my friend? I'm grateful for Charles Spurgeon and how beautifully he expressed that. Spurgeon was a powerful messenger of Christ because... He had welcomed Christ into his repentant heart. And so I hope, friends, that you hear the Holy Spirit whispering to you. Do you have room? Or do you have more room for Christ? What do you... This is a question for you to pray about this week, my friends. What do you need to expel from your heart to make more space for him? What do you need to kick out of your heart to make more space for him. I hope you will ask the Holy Spirit to show you this. I hope you will tell somebody, tell a brother or a sister, tell a friend or a spouse or a parent. What do you need 
to have removed from your heart to make space for Jesus. Listen to what Jesus says in Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. And you should know that when Jesus says this in Revelation 3, he's speaking to the church. (laughs) He's speaking to the church of Laodicea, which is in modern day Turkey. Jesus is saying to people who already go to church, I'm knocking on the door. Will you let me in? People who have already said they believe in Jesus are behind a locked door. And Jesus is knocking on the door saying, Do you hear me calling you? Will you open the door so I can come in and eat with you? And you with me. So my friends, we all have hungry hearts. We have hearts that are seeking for a solution to the emptiness we feel. And nothing on earth can fill the space that is intended for Jesus alone. Not money, or power, or pleasure, or food, or drink, or adventure, or success, or entertainment. And we can't can't purge these idols. We can't kick these things out of our hearts by ourselves because we don't have the right cleaning equipment for our hearts. Only Jesus can do it, friends. And he is ready and willing to wash our hearts clean. Are you ready? Are you ready to welcome him in? Maybe it's the first time for some of you. Maybe it's the hundredth time. But tell Jesus that he is a welcome guest in your heart. Tell him that you want him to be more than a temporary visitor. Because Jesus comes only to be our shepherd our Lord, and our King forever. And so is there room for him in your heart, my friends? Let's pray to him together now. Jesus, thank you that you do not insist that we clean ourselves up before you will come to us. Thank you that you offer us a solution for the stain of the sin in our hearts. Your blood is the only thing that can wash us and make us holy. And so, Holy Spirit, would you show us this week, show each of us the things that we are holding on to in our hearts. Reveal the things that currently occupy the space that belongs to Jesus, so we can repent and be made whole. Father, your Son is welcome here. Thank you for sending him to be our Savior. Amen.